Welcome along, everybody, to the, you can see the meeting's being recorded, um, it is the second of our Highlighting Research in Poverty and Education series. It's also the second good day of the year. That sun is still beating through your windows, so many thanks for spending time and a good day to come along. We've got a great programme uh, this afternoon. We're going to hear about young carers, music education, uh, professional teachers, uh, digital education, and a hot off the press contribution on the, the cost of learning in lockdown. The way that we'll do it is uh, each presenter will speak for five minutes. We may have a question at the end of that presentation, but the idea is we try to get some general discussion at the end. Now, to make it flow better, what would be very helpful for us is if you posted your questions in the chat and I'll monitor those questions on your behalf. So use that chat function to post any questions you want to uh, be presented to the presenters. There's also, I, I think I need to emphasize, there's a wee reactions button right at the bottom of your screen as well. On that reactions button, you will see that there is an applause button. So feel free to use that applause button at the end of the presentation. presentation first of all, for uh, Stephen McKinney from the University of Glasgow, who's going to talk to us about young carers and yep. COVID-19. Stephen. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Um, I the, the, the pandemic, as we all know, has had a, a dramatic impact on the oh, I did put my craft room. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, sorry, could you just make sure that you're on mute? Many thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, the pandemic, um, as we all know, has had a dramatic impact on many aspects of everyday life in Scotland. It's had an effect on many households and household incomes, and as a result, on many children and young people who are dependents. Some of the serious social problems, such as child mental health, child abuse, digital exclusion, and food insecurity, all pre-existed COVID-19 and have been exacerbated by the effects of the pandemic. Uh, for example, some young people who had re received support for mental health issues through the school have unfortunately experienced a reduction in the service. The restrictions and lockdowns have also created enormous difficulties for a group of children and young people who are sometimes absent or receive limited attention in the public and sometimes the academic discourses in education, uh, and those are young carers. The statutory guidance to the Carers Scotland Act 2016 was published in 2018 by the Scottish Government and applies to adult carers and young carers. And the definition that's used for a young carer is the same definition used for an adult carer. And I quote, under the Act, a carer is an individual who provides or intends to provide care for another individual. A carer can be caring for one or more cared for persons. A cared for person can have one or more carers. They don't need to live in the same house. The Act is very clear that there are only two distinctions young carers and adult carers, and there is no provision for young adult carers, 16 to 25, as a distinction. Um, a young carer refers to any person who is under 18 and has caring responsibilities for a family member or members or a friend. It can also refer to a young person who is 18 but has remained at school and has also has caring responsibility. There is, however, no lower age limit now, the 2011 census records that 41% of the young carers in the UK are aged between 10 and 14. And the Scottish Government, uh, Scottish Government guidance acknowledges that there may be a small number of young carers who are very young at preschool stages or early years of primary schooling. In other words, the young carer may be as young as five, or in some cases, even younger. Scottish Government estimates, uh, and if anybody out there can update this for me, I'd be really grateful. Uh, the estimates they use are that there are 44,000 young carers in Scotland. Uh, this is probably higher because this estimate seems to come from 2015. There is an issue that some children do not recognise themselves as young carers. They simply see themselves as looking after other people. The person or persons cared for are likely to be ill, have a disability, a mental health condition, or perhaps suffer from drug or alcohol addiction uh, or related health problems. The caring can include some medical nursing care, personal care, such as helping to wash, dress and eat, practical support, taking the person to shopping or to medical appointments, and often includes emotional support. And the young carer often 
has caring responsibilities for younger siblings. There's some research conducted by Robison, a. Egan and Inglis in 2017 uh, surveyed 11,200 secondary school pupils in Glasgow. And what they wanted to do was find the prevalence of young carers in this sample or whether it was making any difference to their health and well-being. Um, what they discovered was the numbers of children providing care were high, around one in eight pupils were providing care. And almost one third of the pupils commented that nobody knew about these caring duties. Um, there was evidence that they were more likely to be experiencing the effects of poverty. They were often registered for free school meals and often living in a lone parent household. Um, there was evidence that they themselves as young carers had higher levels of illness or disability. And of course, what one of the challenges then has been uh, the outcomes for the young carers during the pandemic. And I, I sourced a small scale survey conducted by the University of East Anglia. Um, and they've demonstrated that many young carers feel a strong sense that school provides a welcome routine and respite from the caring responsibilities. And of course, this has been disrupted by lockdowns and by the school closures. Um, and some of the young carers have experienced higher levels of stress as they've struggled to balance the demands of home learning, whatever mode that is, with caring, including the caring for younger siblings. Um, and many young carers have discovered that, that the personal or persons they're looking after have had deteriorating mental health. Um, some young carers are more socially isolated and disadvantaged than other people, and this has been intensified during school closures. So I just wanted to introduce this topic today because I, I sometimes feel that, well, well, one of the headings I use when I'm teaching about this is invisible children, children we don't hear about very often and we, we, we may not see. And I think a couple of things worry me. Um, the, the lower end, no, there is no lower age limit. And the other thing that worries me is that some of the young carers um, think that what they're doing is just something they do and there's a lack of support. And there's a lot more, but we'll be publishing that a special edition of the Research Education Bulletin. Okay, John, it's me, five minutes. Yep, many thanks, Stephen. I've just clicked my wee applause button at the bottom to show my appreciation, I'm sure you will too. Uh, without further ado, let's let's move on to the second presentation, which is Katie, uh, Katie from the University of Strathclyde, Katie Hunter, that's going to be looking at music education in Scotland. Katie. Okay, thanks. Um, I think Stephen's got my slides there. Yep, hang on. That should be you, Katie. Hang on, and we'll start. That's great. Here we go. There you go. Okay, well, thanks very much for having us here today. Um, I'm just going to be presenting on some research that we undertook looking at the challenges for achieving equitable music education in Scotland. And that was done by myself, Katie Hunter, Alistair Wilson, we're both at the School of Education, University of Strathclyde, and also Leo Moscadini, who's based at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Okay. So in five minutes, I'll just cover, you know, what we did in the research, what we found out and what some of the implications are for this. And it's based on um, this form, the qualitative uh, component of a, a broader study looking at music education in Scotland that was commissioned by the Music Education Partnership Group. Okay. Okay, so what we did was we developed um, three in-depth case studies uh, um, looking at local authority areas. Um, and these were sort of broadly reflective of uh, different local authorities across Scotland. So one was a prosperous island community where there was a strong uh, traditional music scene. The second one was a, a part of an urban area where there was mostly a working class population and significant areas of poverty. And there was not really any conspicuous uh, music tradition there outside of what, you know, like the marching bands. And the third case study we looked at was a semi-rural community with a large rural area and a central city. Um, and a lot of the flagship uh, music organisations visited the concert hall there and there's programmes organised around that. We did a mapping exercise with uh, to look at what provision was available in these local authorities and we did a lot of key um a lot of in-depth interviews with key informants people who were knowledgeable about what was happening in the area in terms of music for young people and we interviewed children young people third sector organizations and um, music teachers okay 
So this is an example of uh, some of the data that we collected, and it shows, um, you know, the, the quite stark inequalities in terms of um, participation in music within schools. So um, there's two schools similar sizes in um, case study A. Uh, we had like 40 students, uh, 40 pupils across um, taking National 5 music, 42 taking higher music, 18 taking advanced higher compared to a school in the more working class area where there was like 10 students taking National 5, 5 at higher music and 3 at advanced higher. So, I mean, we know that like attainment's linked to social class background, but what we were finding was that the free and subsidized tuition that was available for pupils in the school was prioritized for people taking these qualifications. So what we could see was that the provision sort of being skewed towards this more, uh, you know, performance-based criteria. Um, and it benefits those who are able to access the tuition both in and outside of school, but also and also like extracurricular activities of, which really support people's engagement within this with, with this subject. Okay. So some of the key findings are, you know, as well as the unequal access to music that we could see between schools, we could also see there was um, inequality starting to exist within schools as well. So uh, it was reflected in one of the case studies where um, teachers were organizing, you know, lunchtime classes for students that couldn't afford the tuition. Um, so there were, um, so the cost of tuition, especially I think we found in case study C was around 700 pounds plus for, for a student to not only participate in tuition, but also uh, become involved in the sort of extracurricular activities around music ensembles um, and uh, you know the cost of travel to, to these sort of activities. So we could see that inequality was beginning in the primary schools and persisting throughout as parents made decisions of whether to um, you know, pay for the, for the lessons. And we can see that this focus on this sort of performance kind of agenda really, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's becoming like the middle class pupils who, have, um, who are able to access these resources. Okay. So what this means, so, um, you know, despite our current focus on inequality in um, education in Scotland, we've seen that participation in music isn't possible for all children and young people. Um, it's becoming more for those who can finance it, but also those that align culturally with, you know, what's valued in schools. Um, for children, young people from working class, poorer households, disabled children, those with additional support needs, they're effectively now being excluded. And um, we didn't see very strong models of, or any strong models of inclusive practice. We did see little pockets of innovation where um, interested teachers were brokering in um, resources, but it was all very fragile depending on um, sort of teacher interest in this. Okay, next slide. So the implications, uh, we feel, you know, left as it is, the direction that's going, it's becoming, you know, a very middle-class pursuit for not careful, for not interrupting it. Um, and it needs to be addressed, not just the financial issue, but also the sort of social cultural issues as that goes hand in hand with what's being valued and accepted in schools. Okay, last slide. Um, so just to finish, you know, what we're doing, um, Alistair uh, Wilson that I worked with mentioned some of the community um, uh, research that we're doing at the minute. We did see with this research that change is possible. So in case study A, we could see that, um, you know, this sort of trajectory had been interrupted with some funding, but also um, where a broader community involvement was brokered in to try and uh, strengthen uh, people's access and participation in traditional music. And so we're starting to explore some of these ideas at a community level. We can see in that one of the local authorities we're working in that the school system is quite unequal, there's high fees. Um, so we're looking at interventions, piloting those with um, children and young people and brokering in uh, third sector organisations and other music organisations uh, that have this sort of inclusive, uh, uh, you know, that can create inclusive opportunities for young people. So uh, just to finish, if anyone is uh, interested, we'd, we'd love to hear from you as well. So that's, that's our research there. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks very much for that, Katie. Um, we're going to move on to Lindsay. Lindsay, it's Lindsay McDougall from University yeah. of Aberdeen, who's reflecting on professional insights in working in high poverty communities. Uh, Lindsay. 
That's great. Thanks, John. Stephen, have you got my slides? Or yeah, I, I have, Lindsay. Just give, just give me a second. I, oh. I'm not as quick as Professor McKenna. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thanks very much. He's too quick for me. Uh, hang on. Well, Stephen's getting himself ready. Here we go. Just, just to remind people to pop questions in the chat if you want, and we can pick up them in discussion. Sorry, Lindsay, over to you. No, not at all. Great. So, hello. So, what I'm sharing from Aberdeen today is part of a larger project which is supported by the Scottish Government and Scottish Council of Deans of Education. And it's very much focused on researching um, predominantly probationary teachers' pedagogies and their induction year strategies that they use when working in high poverty contexts. And our aim is very much to feed back what we learn into our programmes to better support our undergraduate students. Okay. Thanks. So just a bit of background to the study. Um, we know internationally that there is a policy drive to promote inclusive and quality education. And with that, of can come challenges such as poverty. And poverty is widely recognised as being detrimental to academic attainment, which presents challenges for teachers in such settings that often go beyond standard educational provision. And with teachers having to take on increased responsibilities to help their learners participate meaningfully in the life of the school. Yet it's also well known that many teachers feel unprepared to work with diversity, so the preparation of new teachers to work inclusively with children living in poverty has implication for us as teacher educators worldwide. Okay. Right, um, so as we can see from the slide, inclusive pedagogy as defined by Black Hawkins and Florian in 2011, it is primarily underpinned by this commitment to addressing such learner differences without marginalising or stigmatising them. And one key approach is often to extend what's ordinarily available in the classroom to include everyone, rejecting deficit practices whereby learning is differentiated for some based on preconceived judgments about ability. But it's the last bullet point there, the one about working with others to remove intersecting barriers to inclusion, this notion of relational approach, which is the particular focus here for this data set. Okay. So what did we do? Well, we designed an exploratory multiple case study to examine how probationary teachers learn to enact um, different inclusive pedagogies in schools located in high poverty contexts and each probationer they served as their own case um, and they gathered first person reports through there were observations semi-structured interviews and also reflective diaries just to gather examples of their lived experiences okay next slide so in total, we managed to locate and recruit seven probationer teachers. There were four from two primary schools and three from the same secondary school. And the criteria that we used to recruit and locate these meant that they were all graduates from the same ITE. They'd all studied inclusive pedagogy and they were all working in schools in high poverty contexts. Okay, next one. So our data analysis was guided by our primary research question, which was namely, you know, what are the lived experiences of probationary teachers learning to enact inclusive pedagogy in schools located in high poverty environments? And we used a three-step analysis to drawing on Florian's 2014 IPAA framework to support um, cross-case data analysis. And what we wanted to do there was to really understand um, the probationers context and what they were able to do in relation to inclusive pedagogy. Okay, so the data showed that in terms of the relational aspects of inclusive pedagogy, intra-professional working practices were important but they were defined mainly as being in relation to pupil support assistance and I've highlighted a couple there from Helen who was a primary probationer, names are pseudonyms of course, and Hilary a secondary probationer and I'll just read out Hilary's one and she said the PSAs work with me quite a lot so they know that although I like them to stay with their key pupils I actually like them to circulate the room and use their own initiative. So 
this, now we come to the so what question. So what did we learn? Well, data on the slide is really typical of the wider data set, and it highlighted the important but often the informal nature of intra-professional working, which primarily emerges in support um, in terms of support needs, which emerged during the lesson, and which suggests that perhaps more purposeful interprofessional working practices are something that we could develop further with our students. And in addition, our wider data set also showed that the majority of intraprofessional discussion, as opposed to working practices around inclusion, tended to stall at behaviour management. It didn't start to drill down and look at the, the reasons why the behaviour had kicked off in the first place. Um, and this really resonates with our previous research into student teachers practicum, which found there was little evidence of joint problem solving in terms of inclusive pedagogy. So just on the last slide there, um, so I think it just gives us food for thought um, and specifically, um, I think for ITE focus question two there, where what might we do to support the transition of our induction year um, students in terms of helping them to prepare their intra-professional working um, more readily. Okay. Thank you very much for Lindsay for a masterclass on how to finish in five minutes on the dot. Goodness, this cheering business is easy. Uh, can we move on to the last, not sorry, the penultimate presentation, which will be an ensemble uh, to make a connection with the second presentation. Uh, Stuart, Kevin and Stephen from University of Glasgow, this time talking about digital exclusion and education. Sorry, digi uh, yeah, digital exclusion and education. Okay, I'll start and uh, the guys will pick up. I, I won't be very long. Um, um, the, 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 there are lots of issues and lots of concerns about the extent of digital poverty or digital exclusion throughout the world and the number of children who've been affected. Uh, UNESCO has pointed out that 94% of learners worldwide had to continue their learning at home in some form. And of course, this highlights digital and equity gaps, again, pre-existing gaps, and there are issues such as connectivity in schools and homes and children's safety online. Um, where, where education systems were successful, uh, this was determined by one, the technological infrastructure, and two, the skill set of teachers and pupils required to support such a move. This means the following conditions would really need to be met. Devices are regularly available and functional. There's regular, regular, no, but regularly available. In other words, the child can, can use the, the device on a regular basis and is not sharing with the other members of the family. There's regular access to the internet, not intermittent access. Teachers are competent in the use of technology and the methods of online delivery or hybrid delivery. And many of us, including myself, had to upskill quite dramatically. The pupils have adapted to the new modes of delivery. Well, one very interesting um, thing before I hand over to Stuart and Kevin is, um, in other parts of the world, there's been a very fascinating um, use of alternatives. Um, to the internet and the radio, television, printed learning packs and phone calls have all been used. Um, and of course, this becomes even more important um, for children who are refugees or who are in refugee camps where there may in fact be a language barrier as well. I'm going to hand over to Stuart and Kevin. Thank you, Stephen. Can they? Uh... Yep, I'm going to do it right now. There you go. There you go. Okay, so Kevin and I are not actually going to talk so much about a study as more of an initiative that we've enacted in, in the NC team within the Robert Wound Centre. Um, and I guess taking advantage of the fact that so many people over the last year have begun to move lots and lots of things online, that we're all becoming much more familiar doing things this way as we are today. Um, Having Chris Chapman as a, an advisor to Scottish Government has meant over the, over the year that we regularly asked for information about X, Y and Z. And we thought that, you know, that provided a bit of impetus for this setting up of our expert practitioner panel. What we thought was if we could get, I guess it's a kind of a, a body of um, a teacher practitioners involved through our panel 
we could use them to, I guess, access fairly rapid feedback on a range of initiatives, questions, areas, or whatever. Um, and, you know, that would at least help keep us abreast of some of the changes that were happening as we come in and out of lockdown at different levels, etc. Um, so that we would at least feel as though we were reasonably well informed. So that kind of was, was part of the, the impetus for that. It's fairly recent. We really just got it up and running in December. And since then, we've run a, a presentation with uh, Graham Donaldson looking at um, Teaching Scotland's Future 10 years on. And then we've also conducted uh, two focus groups with um, teachers, approximately 20 to 23 of them looking at generally the impact of um, COVID on um, education. So I, I guess when we, we talked about that, very much teachers were talking about what, what um, Stephen's just mentioned there in, in relation to the impact on pupils as well. Um, but of course, Stephen's preempted a slightly and saying, actually, many of the, the participants were also saying they themselves have experienced difficulties in getting up to speed with the technology and, and not just in terms of the skills, but also in terms of having the appropriate platforms, uh, laptops at home to allow them to, to do this. Um, equally, it, I, I guess it wasn't all negative. I mean, there was no doubt that, that teachers themselves felt there was a, a, a degree of stress and strain on them in moving to this online platform. But I think what struck us was the amount of positive thought that there was uh, coming out of this, um, that they, you know, recognised that they were generating vast amounts of um, online material that in an appropriate repository, this would be quite a wonderful resource. Equally, just in thinking about, um, you know, meeting the needs of all different children, for some actually being able to access lessons online and lessons they could revisit um, could be quite useful as well, particularly for groups of, uh, there were, you know, staff there who did talk to us about the difficulty for some pupils coming to school um, and, and the need, you know, and how helpful it could be for them to, to actually pick some of this stuff, stuff up online. So in that sense, it was, it was um, really quite positive. Equally, it, you know, helping to give them insights into pupils' lives and building uh, better relationships with parents. So again, that was seen as important in that parents would be seeing what exactly or potentially can see what's going on in the class and, and hopefully would improve their engagement there as well. Kevin, do you want to pick up some stuff? Just really, just given the very little time, it's just to say that, as you can see from this and from the evidence we have and everybody's aware of, there's a huge amount of work being done here to provide uh, children and young people with technology, with devices to use. There's massive effort in terms of making educational resources available online and so on. I think what the big, one of the big questions that still stands is what difference is this making to especially those children who do experience digital poverty and poverty uh, per se and it's, it's an early question. Everything's in flux, everything's in transition. But sooner or later, we need to say, are these initiatives, or is this, this digital movement making a difference uh, and helping to support th those children we're focusing on here? Great. Thanks very much. Now, there's a neat connection between that uh, presentation and the one to follow because we've got a, a little extra treat for us. Uh, Sarah Spencer from the Child Poverty Action Group, who released their uh, their updated report of the cost of learning in lockdown. Like the last report that talks about rapid feedback of what's going on, that's exactly what the Child Poverty Action Group have been able to deliver, rapid feedback about what's going on in terms of the, the cost of learning in lockdown. So without further ado, can I hand you over to Sarah? Hi there. Thank you very much for squeezing me in today. Um, can you see the screen? Is that fine? Yeah. Great. Okay, super. Um, so yeah, this is a, an update um, just released yesterday of cost of learning and lockdown research that we released um, last June 
um, uh, during the last sort of, uh, set of school closures. Um, we wanted to look at things again this time round and the update asked similar questions of parents and carers and children and young people um, around digital inclusion, finances generally and support, um, free school meal replacements and, and well-being and other support from their schools and local authorities. We um, heard from just over 1,100 parents and carers and um, uh, 649 children and young people and I'll whip through the main points really briefly and do feel free to come back to me after this with questions. <clears throat> So parents on low incomes um, in the survey said they were more concerned about money um, now than in the first lockdown, which is unsurprising as the financial impact of COVID continues and worsens. Um, spoke about the additional costs of having children at home all day over the last few months, higher food bills, heating the house, keeping them entertained, making sure they have what they need. Um, and 90% of families on low incomes said um, they were spending more on bills while children were at home. Um, free meal replacements and things like the winter hardship payments um, were really, really valued, but weren't reaching everyone. Um, when obviously that is, is very important now as, as people's financial circumstances are changing. Um, particularly um, missing out um, were parents who were in work and above the earnings thresholds for support. Um, and also families who were used to getting um, universal free meals in P1 to 3, but weren't getting that um, in, in lockdown. Um, so obviously lots of stress, anxiety, pressure um, for parents um, around all of this. And added to that were um, challenges around remote learning. Um, of the people responding to this survey, the parents, um, we asked about access to resources to learn. 35% um, of them said they still don't have everything they need for children to take part fully. Um, most commonly, it was about devices, uh, not having them, not having the right ones, having to share, do not on mobile phones, um, and you know all of the stress and inconvenience that creates. For half of the families who said they were missing the resources, they said they hadn't been asked what was needed. Um, I, in the previous term and amongst all of that um, and, and um, you know yeah and amongst all of that there, there were lots and lots of positive stories of resource needs being met you know we had a problem our school sorted it out so lots more of those stories now than there were last time and um, so progress clearly being made um, but children and young people on free meals were more likely to say they were sharing devices and um, so what that might mean is that devices are being provided, but not yet to every child. Um, so progress being made, but still a long way to go. And inevitably we've got some degree of remote learning over the coming months. So this is, you know, this isn't a, a snapshot a retrospective kind of thing. It's it's still going to be relevant um, as, as we move forward. Um, free meal replacements, free school meal replacements, really straightforward here, exactly the same as in the last survey. Um, parents and carers saying that the method of delivery that they, they want to see are um, cash payments rather than vouchers, food parcels and so on. Um, for, for all of the reasons that you can see on the slide there, choice, dignity, being able to buy the food that your children are going to eat is, is um, helpful. Isn't it? Um, so yeah, that's one of the most emphatic things both times round. Um, Support for children and families. Um, lots of really great examples of remote learning support, but um, coming through strongly from children and young people. I was about missing friends, missing face-to-face -face teaching, lots of requests for live lessons, feedback, chances, just a real sort of hunger for, for human connection, I suppose. And, and um, you know, the implications are there. Um, if you don't have the resources to be able to engage with that um, and, and have that connection with your school while, while they're closed. Um, lots in here, um, but not lots of time. So um, there were uh, children and young people wanting help with learning, routine, their, um, mental health. There's lots of anxieties voiced about the future and what all of this means. 
Um, and from parents, they really appreciated from their schools, the support they appreciated were uh, poverty aware, poverty sensitive approaches from schools um, in the autumn term and during lockdown. Um, you know, an understanding of family situations um, and the challenges they were facing and um, support being put in place where it could be. Um, so, yeah, the recommendations um, based on all of this, based on what families are saying, um, um, were <coughs> the ones we, we, um, we made were around prioritising financial support for low income families. Um, we know the difference hardship payments made to, to family budgets and, and to family life. Um, reviewing preschool male eligibility um, thresholds um, in secondary school um, as universal free meals are, are coming in um, are being rolled out from August forwards um, and cash first approaches as well and then continued emphasis on, on the progress that's been made around um, digital inclusion and making sure that children and young people have what they need to learn um, at home or, or out of school. Um, and finally, schools and local authorities continuing to implement poverty aware practices and policies um, in helping to reduce costs and maximise incomes. So I have no idea if that's more than five minutes. I apologise if it was. But, uh, <laughs> well, well, well done, Sarah. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> thanks very much, Sarah. And thanks for, to, to all of our presenters. We, we have about 20 minutes or so for questions and we've had a few posted in the chat already. Yep, get those hand clapping uh, icons up in the screen very much so let me pose a couple of questions uh, on behalf of those that are presenting if you can continue to use the chat that's probably the best way for us to, to manage it but the first two questions uh two together are for katie uh, from university of strathclyde in the music one's a specific point of clarification paul mcdonald asks and i'll put them both together katie uh -huh. uh, paul mcdonald asks whether they're delivering music education in gaelic in any of the schools um, and more of a, a specific point of clarification. But Angela Jap also asks uh, whether or not uh, the creative approaches to delivering music education that have been evident over the last year, whether that holds any potential going forward for a more inclusive uh, offer to, to um, uh, music education. Yeah, okay. So, well, the first point about the Gaelic, I, it, the one in Gaelic music education, so the short answer to that was no. Um, it was uh, delivered in sort of more mainstream schooling. Um, and the second uh, point about the digital, um, definitely, I think um, some of the stuff that we're looking at in communities is, uh, you know, using digital inclusion, uh, digital music. But just a point about the way things are, you know, uh, delivering like music tuition in a more sort of formal sense. Um, you know, we are aware that, uh, you know, a lot of from teachers that a lot of um, lessons are going online for, you know, maybe pupils from more middle class backgrounds. But, um, you know, some of the uh, students from more working class backgrounds aren't able to take advantage of that. Um, for whatever reason, so and it and it might be around some of these ideas around digital, um, you know, digital inclusion that we've talked about. So we kind of know that everything's sort of carrying on as normal, maybe for 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 people that are able to access this kind of teaching, um, one to one. But it doesn't really interrupt the kind of more, you know, what's sort of culturally valued in the schools. Great, Th thanks for that, Katie. I don't know, uh, Angela, whether you wanted to come back. Uh, with a, any comment on that about creative approaches or um, or you're happy to move on? No, I, I was just going to say, I, you're absolutely right, Katie. They are taking on an awful lot of creative approaches and I think it will continue. It has actually, um, through Glasgow Create in particular, they've been very good at making up more digital connections for everyone because one mm -hmm. of the big issues we've got for music is the fact of confidence. Um, so it's trying to rebalance that to show the parents they can get involved as well as the teachers. Um, but I'd say have a wee look at Glasgow Create. I think you find a lot of really useful information. Yeah. On that. And and just on that point, you know the the you know young people that are being sort of nurtured with their parents and stuff. That's like another element to their engagement. That's maybe you know uh, quite difficult. You know we've found that the teachers are taking on that role of nurturing engagement. So without that sort of access to teachers day to day, you know they may be uh, falling behind that way as well. 
Yeah. And while, while, we've, while we've got you, Katie, um, do you think has been reading my mind? Because I was thinking big noise when I was listening to you as well. So we know big noise have been operating in the rap plot, they've been operating in Dundee, uh -huh. they've been operating now in Govan Hill, uh, maybe other areas too. And do you think is wondering whether or not initiatives such as that would have any impact on music provision more generally if it's targeted at areas of deprivation? Um, yeah, I mean, Alistair's here, so uh, we've got quite a lot to say on this. I don't know, Alistair, do you want to jump in here? Tell Alistair, they can see it very briefly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a tricky question. I think the, the question for me in that would be that some of these programmes are hugely expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the, the advice we take there is from one of the guys that, that did an evaluation of Big Noise and, um, and such programmes, and he basically said we should treat them with the the sort of caution that we treat any kind of big multinational company that's selling us a product, you know what I mean? So in, ter in terms of it solving our problems with music, you know, we're having, I think we have to be very cautious. Um, and I think a lot of the problems Katie's described earlier are about things that are, you know, within our own communities um, that can be resolved there if we look at it more carefully rather than always seeking to import some, something that'll fix things. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, Claire Colburn's just pointed, uh, posted a question that kind of points to two presentations. It, it touches on uh, the, the Glasgow University second one in digital edu exclusion, but also some of the points that Sarah had mentioned. Claire's asking the question about whether or not in dealing with digital issues, digital exclusion, does what we need to do extend to support for parents as well? Is it simply about delivering to children or do we need to think more broadly about parents and carers? I wonder if Stephen could start and then I could move in move on to Sarah for, or, or Stephen, or one of Stephen's team to start and then move on to Sarah to respond. I, I'm, I'm quite happy to start, John. Um, yeah, I, ab absolutely. But I, I, I think there's something that I've not had a chance to see yet. Um, the, the, the pandemic kind of came out the blue and, and we were all, uh, you know, the expression is caught short. Uh, actually, that's not true. If we look very carefully back to the last pandemic, which didn't really affect us that much, there were recovery plans uh, produced by the Scottish government and by the English government. Uh, and those recovery plans are pretty much what people are talking about now, about ensuring that people are prepared um, in the event of a pandemic, uh, not just teachers and pupils, uh, trainee teachers and the parents and carers as well. So, you know, the, we, we've kind of forgotten those documents which were actually quite prophetic. So the answer is yes. Uh, what, what, one of the big things that UNESCO is pushing at the moment is a, a recovery plan. We need a very careful recovery plan, but a recovery plan that takes us 5, 10, 15 years down the line and we don't forget it. Because if this happens again, we don't want to be caught short again. Stuart. Thank you very much, Steve. We'll move on to Sarah. Sarah, you, your thoughts then? Um, should the, the provisions extend to parents as well? Well, yeah. Um, so the the digital literacy for parents wasn't something we looked at. Um, but um, <clears throat> I suppose what we did hear from parents was around the challenges for them digitally were, were the the stress of trying to fit everything in while while working themselves, while kind of you know all of the stresses and strains of, of kind of, um, of, of a household, um, and often kind of passing devices around and sharing them between between each other and so on. So I think um, I think for the the digital literacy wasn't mentioned um, and is obviously very important. Um, but I think the main challenges that, that we came across were around um, that first step of even having the resources that you need to, to even start thinking about that. Um, I know there was, um, there's been a lot of, there was a lot of effort made in the autumn term um, by schools to make sure that children and young people were um, very familiar with, you know, teams and how to engage with remote learning um, and I, I imagine that in, in many schools that extended to parents as well. I'm not sure about the extent of that though. Yeah, thanks Sarah. I, I don't know whether you want to come back, Claire, if you have any specific thoughts about the extent to which even in general uh, beyond digital issues we should be delivering to parents and carers. I wonder if you wanted to say anything on that. Um, yeah, I can. So it was really um, the thinking was around what to our um, it's more around the literacy rather than the devices. So what we were finding was quite often um, our children are able to use them, but sometimes parents aren't able to support them to use them. Um, and we as a local authority provided some um, some support to get people online and 
We have done that in partnership with our Citizens Advice Bureau and third sector as well. But we weren't necessarily linking with education to see where those pupils were finding. So these were you know, individuals, they were generally older um, residents that we were dealing with rather than parents as such. But I just thought there might be an opportunity to try and link together that support for digital literacy with parental need, which might be there as well to support children. John, John, John there's, there's a major discussion about digi digital literacy and, and the age the age groups. And of course, the research tells us that as as not 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 everybody, but as we go into the older age groups, then digital literacy does become a problem. So I'm just picking up what Claire said there. Yeah, and I mean, there's a, maybe a broader issue in terms of poverty strategies as well. We know we have local child poverty action reports where the local areas are thinking holistically about what has to be done in general to tackle poverty in their area. And I think what Claire speaks to there are, are, are more holistic approaches, not narrowly focused on just education, but yeah. services working across each other, you know, wrapped around the individuals and families rather than de delivered by individual services well well we, well we can have you there uh, not Stephen sorry but well well we, we've got you there Sarah there was another question from Catherine Reed which is really giving CPAG a chance to say what you believe in most strongly and Catherine Reed's point was just is this simply not a case we need to give parents more money is that not the the ultimate solution yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Answer. yeah I mean you know more money um better outcomes isn't it um you know and that's why it's so important to maximise family incomes and for all of us to sort of play a part in that. Um, you know, more money for families, it gets spent on children, on home learning environment, enriching experiences, there's less stress and pressure in the household. And, and you know, all of that can, well, can, just... only, can only help children's education. Great, thanks for that, Sarah. And, and of course, the universal provision is another way in which we can make people's money stretch a little bit further. And, and certainly the school meals uh, is a move in that direction, the extension in, in, in uh, primary schools. Uh, well, I'm going to indulge myself as chair and ask a question and, and, and going to pose that for Lindsay. Because Lindsay, it's uh, really interesting, and I think this is really important work that we think about practice and we think about the everyday actions and you know the, the inclinations and behaviours that those that work with people experiencing poverty should take. But high poverty environments tend to be largely large urban environments. And we've got some rural uh, authorities and some people that work in rural areas here. I just wondered whether you, you, you feel a second stage of your work might be to do similar types of work, but looking at what has to be done with practitioners, probationers, in areas where there is poverty, but it's in a school where largely poverty doesn't exist, whether that's a very different experience that you're maybe thinking about too. Any thoughts on that, Lindsay? Yeah, I mean, our research doesn't, we're very aware that some contexts, although there's schools that might have an SIMD um, rating of one, two, et cetera, but there can still be children in, you know, SIMD ratings of six and, you know, yeah. above where they're also um, experiencing and living in poverty. And I think at all schools, regardless of the catchment area, have to be very mindful that you poverty proof the schools and that you address and make sure you're teaching pedagogies and strategies um, are very transparent and inclusive. Um, and I think a key thing for us that we find even um, across the board, I think it comes down to this notion of joint problem solving. And perhaps we need to give some of our probationers and our, um, our undergraduates before they go into probation or more tools, um, practical tools, how they really take the theory and that then becomes realized in practical solutions, which I don't think is always apparent. And my own thinking is sometimes I think we've got a lot to learn from the world of autism education. I've got colleagues who work in that and they often come up with very practical toolkits and strategies and checklists. Um, but we don't seem to always have that type of aspects for um, how we work with people in poverty. And whilst I think we need the theory and the data and the policy, I do think sometimes when you're in the middle of um, intense teaching situations, especially probationers where there's layers of newness. There are sometimes new schools, new families, new children, um, sometimes they've moved house, um, new local authority, and they need a lot of practical help. Um, and I think we're keenly aware of that. 
Yeah, thanks very much, Lindsay. I think it's also maybe an opportune moment, following on from what Lindsay says here, to remind people that the PACT project of EIS launches tomorrow afternoon. The PACT project is a professional learning project, again funded by the Scottish Government, which just encourages teachers and other educational practitioners to reflect on their practice and how working with poverty, dealing with poverty issues as they present, uh, is something that should be part and parcel of what they do. And it's got some training modules as part of that programme. So if you haven't heard of the PACT programme, it's not an acronym, it's simply a PACT. Uh, Google PACT and EIS, and maybe you've got some time available tomorrow to engage that. Now, I know that uh, uh, Mary Lappin's been very patient because she put, I think, the first question in, but I've not asked it yet. Mary was asking, and it goes to Stephen McKinney, about whether there's any uh, evidence about carer progression to HE and whether that reflects, um, you know, school experiences. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'll, try and be, I'll try and be brief, but as we all know, it's not in my nature, um, like <laughs> Alistair Wilson. Um, it, it's it's to do with a number of things, Mary. It's to do with the, the, the time, and it's to do with uh, the identification of a, a young person as a young carer. Um, time, how much time do they have for study? How much time do they have to prepare for their classwork, for examinations? And secondly, if they've not self-identified, or there are two ways you can be identified, self-identification or identified the local authority. Now, if you've not self-identified and you've refused to identify the local authority, then we don't know how much time the young person might be involved in caring. So the, the, that, that makes it highly problematic. The research from Una Robinson et al. said that the, they were much less likely to see themselves in higher education. Um, I just want to put an advert in for, for John McKendrick and the fabulous work the Caledonian Club does. I, I know I do this all the time. I just think it's brilliant that they, they bring young people in and support them as, as they progress into higher education and help young people who struggle with the idea of it. And also I want to praise Alistair and the work he's done in Strathclyde with the same thing, trying to support young people into higher education. And, and maybe we need to be very careful and attuned to young carers and supporting them into higher education. Brilliant question, Mary, thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Just, just on that, Mary, I mean, have you any thoughts yourself? It certainly is now an explicit target for Scottish Government to, you know, look at the metrics for carers in higher education. And as Stephen says, our institution, not just in generally about poverty, env environments in which poverty is prevalent, but specifically for young carers to support them, we've got programmes. Any thoughts yourself and what has to be done, Mary? Thanks, John, and thanks, Stephen. I suppose what I was interested in um, is the the choice of university, for example, that carers would go to, because we have a few of it. The, the numbers aren't large, of course, but here at Glasgow, of course, we have some um, young carers, indeed, are, are our students. And I suspect they go to university, if they go to university, they go to universities that are near their home, for example. Or is it, or is it they go actually go further away to come away from their carer duties, you know, to go and choose to study somewhere else. I suppose that was my that was my uh, interest. And uh, and second to that would be how do we best support our, our students who are carers? But that's maybe for another day. And one one of the nice things about this seminar series is not just talking about you know closing off topics; it's opening up topics. You've raised a, a few interesting questions, Mary, that sound very much like research projects that need to be done and need to be investigated. There, you know, there may be things that those that are in the room, not necessarily just the speakers, but those in the room might want to think about taking forward uh, yeah. in terms of supporting carers. Th thanks for that, Mary. Again, I'm going to indulge myself as chair again, and it, it, this is something that I've, I've, I've not known and been kind of really keen to know, and it goes back to Sarah's comments about digital, uh, but also the University of Glasgow team in digital. Now, before COVID kicked in and we realised then we had to do things to try to provide digital equipment and, and get access and learning during lockdown, Glasgow City Council committed itself to roll out iPads to all of, of all of the children in the city. Now, it might just be me and my ignorance, but I've heard nothing about that during lockdown. Now, to me, if they had managed to roll out in advance, wouldn't that have been a wonderful case study for demonstrating the importance and the utility and, and evaluating? But it might not even just be for the Glasgow team. It might be anybody in the room. Did that happen? And um, if it did happen, how is it going? But I'll put it yeah. to the Glasgow team first. Can I, can I just chip in there? Uh, Stuart and I and other colleagues at Rotherham Centre work supporting uh, professional learning and inquiry in the the regional improvement club with the, the West one that goes across includes Glasgow and you know I think 2018 they started rolling out these 50,000 plus iPads and I think 
what we've picked up is that it, it is playing a key role. Uh, the feedback from local authority officers and teachers is that it's, it's helping. But it goes back to that point I made earlier on, there's been no systematic evaluation of is it helping and who is it helping? Uh, and, and the comments we've heard about, you know, can certain families, do, does certain families need support in helping their children to use this? Because I think a lot of children will have the skills, but they may have to share these devices. So I think it's contributed and there's been po positive anecdotal evidence, but we, we need to know Open evaluation. systematically. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kevin. Sarah, I don't know whether there was any sense of differences across the country and that, you know, some areas seem to, in, in the, the CPAG research, whether some areas seem to be doing better than others. Um, do you know what? I, I don't think it'd be fair to say that there was, just because it was a fairly small sample. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was it was a fairly small sample. Great. Um, but as as a as a, a Glasgow parent, um, I think uh, there there is there is good anecdotal um, sort of uh, evidence of of um, the difference that the, the um, rollout's making. But beyond that, I'm not too sure. And just while, while you're there again, Sarah, you, you'd mentioned about just above the margins of poverty being one of those target groups. And I've heard this with other research as well. You know, we, we, we do well, we're not perfect, but we do well with those that are passported and account of their benefits, but there, there are so many others in need that we're missing. We've got degrees of flexibility in schools that head teachers can in, in some ways uh, exert that flexibility to ensure that the, the children that they know or indeed can be delivered. Are there any other ways in which you think that we could do this more systematically, Sarah, over and above passported benefits to uh, identify those that are in need and then to meet those needs? Um, yeah, I think I think that's a tricky thing that you're, you're saying there in terms of the flexibility because, and I think I've heard from people, it's becoming even more difficult because um, with more families um, struggling financially um, but with COVID it's often a case of oh god where does the support go and you know it's it's about identifying people in SAMD and free meals not being you know a, a foolproof way of doing that um, so I think there is there is great value in um, universal approaches at the moment there always is but um, I think in terms of getting information um, out to all families about all support that is available. Um, I think that's really, really critical. And we heard lots of stories from parents in the research um, about how, how that was really beneficial and support there to help families take that up. Um, and, and, and again, you know, that flexibility when it comes to, to paying for school costs um, and, and realizing that poverty doesn't look one particular way. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, folks, I mean, the, the presenters were um, exemplary in their timekeeping, and I'm going to be exemplary in mine and, and the cheering as well and, and deliver uh, a, a session that ends on time so that you can grab the last of that spring sunshine uh, before it goes. Uh, before I do that, before I just remind you of what the next event is, can we maybe just uh, virtually put our hands together and clap and thank each one of our five presenters for a, a really um, interesting session and also those that pose questions as well. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for doing so and getting that debate up and running. But the, all that remains for me to say is to remind, well, thank you for coming, of course, but to remind you that the third event in our, our spring series of uh, seminars on poverty and education will be on the 20th of May, same time, uh, 4 p.m., same place from your living room or wherever it is you're sitting just now. Uh, and it'll be Chris Chapman and Alison Drever that will give us two, two presentations next time around. So many thanks, folks, again, and uh, see you on the 20th of May.